At this point, it takes, I take great pleasure in passing the microphone over to Erica Ronestad. She's one of our precious metals analysts. She will be one of the speakers, uh, and she is also going to be running this conference. So my work here is done, and thank you for coming.
the government passed um, an amendment, an act um, with a section 54 in inside the, uh, the act stating that if a fatality occurred or if there was um, a uh, worry that a fatality, fatality would occur, then they would stop production and investigate what was going on. Um, so that's led to uh, the fatalities, the is all the issues with mining in um, PGM deposits has resulted in a lot of production stoppages throughout the years. Um, and again, there was uh, alluding to electricity in 2008, South Africa's um, primary electricity supplier, ESCOM, uh, witnessed um, electricity shortages um, in 2008 through 2009, and that resulted in um, shutdowns of PGM mining. Um, factors including secondary uh, supply would be price. Um, secondary supply is highly price sensitive. So when you see prices rising, that's really positive for secondary supply. When you see them falling, um, there's a withdrawal of uh, recovery in the PGM, of PGMs. Um, you also want to take a look at the auto scrappage trends that are going on. Um, I'll go into that a bit. Okay. So I went to a little bit of the factors that affect um, PGM supply, and uh, now I'll go into a little bit of the trends that actually occurred. So in 2010, platinum supply rose by 4.6%, um, and a lot of that was driven by in a huge increase in secondary supply. Secondary supply rose by over 20%, almost 30% um, that year, and that was because of the 21% increase in prices, which is positive for secondary supply. Uh, mine supply also rose at 1.7%. Um, palladium uh, mine uh, total supply increased 7.4% in 2010, um, and that was similar trends, um, higher prices. Uh, Palladium rose about 96% last year. That resulted in a huge inflow of secondary recovery of palladium as well. So now I'll get a little bit into fabrication demand. Um, the factors that influence fabrication demand, um, obviously economic growth. Um, when you have a lot of uh, healthy economic activity, you have um, Increased auto sales, increased purchases of jewelry, um, increased purchases of electronics, and so generally economic growth is positive for um, PGM fabrication demand. Um, you want to take a look at the makeup of auto markets, diesel versus gasoline. Um, I'll get a little bit more into that on the next slide. Um, you want to take a look at the commercial markets and the passenger car markets because they're uh, they can be quite different each year, and the trend is going on there. Um, for commercial, um, typically there's a higher PGM content in the auto catalyst of commercial vehicles, and that's just because commercial vehicles are larger, so they require higher loadings. Um, tightening emission standards, this is an ongoing process. Um, as the emission standards grow tighter, typically that's positive for fabrication demand because it requires higher PGM content. Uh, you want to take a close look at regional auto sales trends and market saturation levels, which I'll also get into a little bit in the next few slides. So this year, um, we expect about a 4% increase in auto sales. Um, it's lower, that rise is lower than what we expected earlier in the year and what the market in general expected earlier in the year. Um, so nevertheless, it's still growth, but it doesn't really compare to the 12.5% growth we saw last year which was a recovery year, so that is an important factor there. So this chart shows um, the percentage of gasoline passenger cars in auto markets, um, some key countries. Um, China is the largest auto market um, by auto sales, and uh, that's followed by the USA. Um, Europe is important, but they're a little bit different because they have about 50% going into diesel auto sales. And the reason for that is um, tax incentives. Uh, taxes are lower on the um, diesel uh, gasoline. So that's why more diesel vehicles are sold in Europe. Um, I alluded to market saturation levels before. Um, when you take a look at 
In, in the U.S., you'll see more replacement um, auto sales. Uh, so, you know, people will be scrapping their old vehicles, buying new ones, um, because the market is largely saturated there. But there's a lot more scope for growth in countries such as China and India, where the ownership of vehicles is very low um, relative to other countries. So, the you know, as income growth takes place in those countries, you have higher likelihood of brand new ownership um, people entering that, those auto markets. So that's pretty positive for um, fabrication demand. I talked mostly about auto markets <clears throat> um, just because much of the um, PGM fabrication demand comes from the auto sector. Um, but there's also demand from the jewelry markets. Uh, for platinum, there's about 27% of total fabrication demand coming from jewelry markets. Um, and about 40% going to auto. Uh, for palladium, about 60% goes into um, auto, and for uh, palladium electronics, it's about 15% of auto uh, fabrication now. Um, so it's important to look at those markets. Uh, the jewelry markets are also price sensitive, similar to um, in terms of secondary supply. When prices are lower, you might see higher jewelry sales um, on the fabrication demand side. Investment demand has um, been playing an increasingly uh, more significant role in uh, influencing prices of PGMs in recent years. Um, part of that is the introduction of retail investment vehicles, um, exchange traded products, as they're called. Um, we track about nine of them, and so far this year we have about <coughs> 1.5 million um, ounces being held in platinum ETPs and about 2 million being held in palladium ETPs. Um, so far this year, palladium holdings are actually down about 125,000 ounces, whereas platinum is up about 250,000 ounces. Um, part of that is platinum is considered um, a safe haven, uh, so there's been a lot of safe haven buying next to gold. Palladium is a bit more of an industrial commodity relative to other PGMs, or relative to platinum rather, um, so it's been kind of dampened. Uh, investment demand has been reduced just because of expectations for economic growth um, and fabrication demand for the metal. Palladium is um, the smaller of the markets um, relative to platinum palladium, and uh, it's also more concentrated um, than platinum and palladium markets. 70% uh, of mine supply comes from South Africa and is only produced as a byproduct, um, therefore it's mined uh, somewhat independent of its price. Uh, demand, 80% of demand comes from the auto sector alone. Um, so, so far we've seen prices down about 22% this year, from around 24 to around 18.50 now. Um, and a lot of that is just because of the um, uh, reduction in auto demand that's been occurring and has been weighing on the prices of rhodium. Um, a new exchange traded product was introduced for rhodium um, in the middle of the year, and it hasn't really had too much of an impact on prices. Um, so we'll see how that develops. It did have a, a, a little bit of a spike effect, <laughs> um, but it didn't last. <laughs> okay, um, I'll take some questions, um, if we have any. Erica, I know you, uh, I know you before the but do we know how much it costs to mine an ounce of rhodium? <laughs> um, no, uh, it's, it's strictly a byproduct, so it's never reported. Um, but that said, we track um, the mining of one ounce of platinum group metals. So it's kind of impacted in that one chart that I showed you guys, where there's about $800 to mine one ounce of platinum group metals. And the breakdown would be about 60% platinum content in that one ounce, 30% um, palladium, and 10% rhodium. We make that breakdown because it's the general, um, uh, it's indicative of um, importance. Hi, Eric. Uh, on the previous slide, the supply for rhodium exceeded demand by what does it? Two, 2,000 ounces or? Mm. 